mind you that we were studying the Eisenberg Hamiltonian, which is an Hamiltonian where spins can hop around uh, in our lattice, which has L sites. It's a ring. And uh, let me clarify a couple of things that I think people were a little bit confused about. So let's try to make sure that everyone fully understands everything in all detail. So we can start diagonalizing one excitation, two excitations, three excitations, and so on and so forth. One excitation is just a plane wave. Two excitations is two plane waves. One which is an incoming wave, one which is an outgoing wave. Starting at three excitations, we can prepare three moments and then scatter them around and get, uh, and get what is written here. And, uh, and let's try to think a little bit about this, this, this claim that these, are the, these wave functions diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So for one excitation, it's obvious that it does. Any Hamiltonian that has translation invariance would do it. Any Hamiltonian with translation invariance is, of course, diagonalized by a plane wave. So if I, instead of putting a permutation here that permutes sites sin n plus 1, I add an extra term that permutes sites sin n plus 2, of course, it will still be diagonalized by the same plane wave, but the dispersion relation will be a bit different. That's just consequence of translation invariance. Is it clear? So any Hamiltonian with translation invariance, you put a plane wave, it will work, and it will give you something. For two particles, it's almost obvious that it had to work. For two particles, you know that if you prepare two particles with momenta p1 and p2, if you conserve energy and momenta, you must get back after scattering the same p1 and p2 in two dimensions. So it almost implies this form. This is what I wrote here. <coughs> this is a consequence of energy and momenta conservation, except when they are very, very close. When they are very close, the way function approaches, when the magnets are very close, I could get some garbage. But then, as soon as we consider the components of the wave function where they are separated, I should get back to just two plane waves. Okay? That's what will happen generically. Generically, if we will have some particles that have some interaction, some potential, where the interaction length is, say, small l, for distances smaller than small l, the wave function is a mess. But for distances bigger than small l, it is just some asymptotic states that come in and go out. So in this case, what is the asymptotic region? Because the Hamiltonian is so short range, it is just permutation of two neighboring sites, what we know is that except potentially when they are really close to each other, when they are really neighbors, except maybe for this case, that turns out that to work. So what is non-trivial is that it also works when they are really on top of each other. And that's non-trivial. We have to act with Hamiltonian and check if it works or not. And that's what you were supposed to do in the tutorial. Right? But this is non-trivial. And in fact, as usual, where, uh, while we knew that these plane waves had to work when they are well separated, to compute this S matrix, that is to say what's the gluing condition that tells me, given an incoming wave, what's the outgoing wave, of course this requires knowing what happens when they are nearby. That's, after all, where they are scattering. So the particles come by solving Schrodinger equation in the region where they are nearby. It will tell you what's the relative coefficient between this plane wave and this plane wave, when they are well separated, any plane wave by itself diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. They are just moving freely. Okay? <clears throat> so, n equals 2 is almost trivial. For any system, we know that if the ends are well separated of that form, we know we should then compute this S matrix by studying the region where they are close. What's a bit non trivial here is that it also works for n1 equal n2 minus 1, which you can think is like a curiosity. It's not crucial for anything we said, as, you, as I will emphasize soon. What about n bigger than 3? n bigger than 3, it's very non-trivial. In fact, it's even non-trivial even if there exist these mysterious higher charges that for now it's a bit like a leprechaun. I have to tell you where they are. But uh, even if such higher charges exist, that I said if they exist, they imply this scattering, whatever. Even, even if this exists, all this would tell you is that, again, if they are well separated, it, it ought to be a linear combination of those six terms. But again, when they are very close together, when 3 are one after the other, or when uh, you have something together, again, it's a bit non-trivial that it works, and again, you would have to plug it, act with Schrodinger equation, try to see if it diagonalizes or not, and see that remarkably it also works when they are nearby. Okay? Is it clear now what is a claim, and what, is, what has to be checked, and so on? Now, on the other hand, there's something interesting, which is that if I know that this way functions have to work modulo potentially some details when they are nearby, I can still impose periodicity. I impose that the wave function when I have three particles here, 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 or when this guy goes around. And this must give the same thing. 
This doesn't care about what's happening when they are very close by. So if I impose the periodicity condition like I wrote it yesterday, where the wave function comes back to itself, it does imply always bit equations. And to get these bit equations, which have this meaning that I take a particle, take it around the world, and it scatters with everyone else, and the total phase, which is the free propagation, plus the phase shift acquired when it goes through each other particle should be one, still holds. And this indeed is a consequence of having this factorization. It is a consequence of these higher charges, because it's all about saying what happens when the particle goes around, it picks an S matrix every time, provided we have enough space, which is not that much, we know this has to work. Okay? So, in short, for integrable theories, for theories for which we have these higher charges, and if you want to know the spectrum of these theories, all we have to do is find the S matrix and the dispersion relation, find this epsilon of P and the S matrix of P and P1 and P2. And if we do, we can find the spectrum of our model. Uh, unless the interaction length is so big that it invalidates this picture of scattering. Questions? Any question about the tutorial or about anything else? About the logic, what is an assumption, what's the claim? Ah, okay, so now uh, you could ask me, are we going, uh, can we, uh, how do we derive this? How do we check that this goes by the Hamiltonian in an efficient way? And there are many techniques that go by the name of coordinate Pitanzats, algebraic Pitanzats, functional Pitanzats. There are many techniques for solving it. But given that the claim is rather sharp and it should be clear, and uh, if you understand the physics of the claim, I'm not going to bother proving this statement. If you are interested, uh, I can refer you to some online lectures that I gave. I mean, it's, it's rather conventional stuff, but uh, I don't think it's crucial for the logic of the lecture. So I will leave it as a claim. You can check to one particle, two particles, and we will do many convincing checks that this had to work. But if you want in private, I can tell you a little bit about how to prove these general statements if you want. Or if you really insist, I can do it. Um, Question, yeah. Yes. 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 No, that, that, that's absolutely true. So if we take, say, one particle, so let's, let's uh, that's absolutely true. If we take one particle, for example, so n equal one, right? if we take just one particle, this Schrodinger equation, when you write that Hamiltonian acting on psi equal energy times psi, and then you ask, what does it imply for the wave function? This is equivalent to saying that Lambda, which is Hamilton, and then twice wave function at n minus, and then, as you said, wave function at other positions, right? So it's kind of a discrete Laplacian. And of course, even in this simple case, I cannot just focus on one position. Of course, this is an equation that requires knowing the full wave function. Similarly there, when I will have two particles, I will write for n equals to two, I will write energy times wave function of n1, n2. And here I will write a bunch of terms uh, for n1, where, where we have n1 plus minus uh, 1 or plus 1 minus 1 or 0. We will have a bunch of neighbors of n1, n2, but not much. It's not like the wave function couples n plus 20 with, uh, with n. But of course, yes, to know the wave function, it will require, it will uh, couple uh, a few terms, you write a bunch of terms, and then you try to solve with this ansatz, and you see that it works if the S matrix is what it is. Right? Any other question? There was another question? Yes? 
But um, n equals two plus higher charges implies n bigger than equals to two, right? <coughs> n equals yes, yes. So you have both n equals two. You know that. Uh. Yeah, if you have n equals to 2, and if, you, if we can see where are these higher charges, we know that n bigger or equal than 3 will work. Modulo eventually some potential terms when the n's are very close, when n1 and n2 are very close, there we could have some, some extra junk. Right? I mean, you see, you, the wave function could be this plus some constant if n1 is n2 minus 1. Who would forbid you this? Ah, this if, if they are separated, you don't see this constant. It's like some small garbage. You are scattering some particle, one and two. They, you can have an incoming and an outgoing wave, but here there is some explosion region, and here you just have a mess. And this mess would be this. It just happens that this is zero, but uh, it could be not zero, and we would not, uh, it would not invalidate if this was not zero, it would not uh, invalidate the red box, for example. The red box would not care about such terms, about such mass. It is just about imposing periodicity in the region where it is safe. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So, where are these charges? So I will start by a claim where the notation will, uh, which is a bit uh, kind of an alien notation, so I think you will be a little bit surprised by what I'm going to write. So let me make a claim. But it's a well-posed mathematical claim. We will check it. Uh, if I want to compute my Hamiltonian, which of course this is the interesting term, right? Who cares about the identity? Identity is just a shift of the energy by L. So the claim is the following, that this Hamiltonian is equal to the following thing. It's equal to 1 over i, i square root of minus 1, derivative with respect to u, u is a new variable, and then let me write the equation and then we'll see. Logarithm of trace u. Okay, so that's the claim. And, the cl and now let's explain a little bit this notation and so that we can decode it a little bit. So now, for, uh, for about 20 minutes, I will do a bunch of things that will look very mathematical in nature and heal motivated. And then we will have to sum come back and summarize a little bit why we were doing such things and what lessons we can draw and uh, how could uh, we generalize what we are doing to any general spin chain and so on and so forth. But for now, you will have to bear... You will have to trust me and uh, go on a little bit, not understanding very well why we are doing such crazy manipulations. Yeah. So let, let's explain a little bit what uh, this notation and, uh, and first understand why this identity is true, even though a priori you might say, why do I care at all about such identity? So this, let, let's, introduce, let's uh, piece by piece introduce a little bit. So this U here is called the spectral parameter. So it is just some random complex number. And you see that you introduce it, but immediately you remove it by putting it to zero. So nothing special here. This zero is an auxiliary space whereas this one up to L is the physical sp space at site one up to site L of my spin chain. This is an auxiliary space which is isomorphic to the physical space. In other words, it's, a pro it's C2. Just spin up or spin down. It's just an auxiliary space like the physical space. Then this object here, R 0J, which is U plus I permutation that permutes whatever is in this auxiliary space and J, this is what's called, it's an R, so it's called the R matrix. 
Okay? And more generally, if we draw a picture like this, um, where we put a letter U and a letter V, this would be defined as R of U minus V. Um, zero J, where this is the physical space Vj, and this is the auxiliary space V0. Okay? This trace is a trace over the auxiliary space. So it means you put on the, on the auxiliary space, spin up or spin down, and you sum over the two possibilities. So this trace of all this stuff here, graphically, is the following. I just multiply many R matrices in this fashion, where I can think that I put some U here and zero everywhere else, because I just multiply R matrices at U. And after multiplying all these guys, I take a trace, which means closing it like that. After doing this, this is an object that if you see, it acts on the Hilbert space, right? Which is just on our Hilbert space of our spin chain. Let's call this uh, straight H into the Hilbert space again. So it's an operator like the Hamiltonian that acts on the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space. Okay. This operator, we can call it, we can define, let's introduce some notation also for what is inside. Let's say it's trace of a matrix L of U. Before taking the trace, we are calling this object L of U. And the object after calling the trace, let's call it T of U. It's just names. So we have a name now for this building block, it's the R matrix. For the full product is the L matrix. And for the trace is the T matrix. Yes? What, what do you want me to explain? A V, a U, and the argument is U minus V. Okay? So, I mean, just to be clear, for example, suppose we have this picture, right? Let's say we have some incoming indices I1, I2, right? Where this I1, I2 can be up or down. We have some auxiliary index A and B, for example, and some outgoing index J1, J2, right? So what is this object very explicitly? There is an index that I have to sum over, let's call it C, and then this picture, if I put here some U, and here I put some zero and some zero, this will be our matrix with indices A and I1, going to index J1 and C at U minus zero times our matrix with index C and I2 going to J2 and B again at U minus zero, which is what we just tried omitting the indices as R of U times R of U. <coughs> So you see that this, this object here that I wrote here, where does it act on? Who are, who are the free indices? The free indices is I1, I2, and A. And the free indices is upstairs. It's J2, J1, and B. 
If I were to take the trace to sum over b equal to a, I would kill this index, and now I would act on i1, i2 going to j1, j2, which would be the Hilbert space of two spins going to two spins. That's what we do when we take the trace. We get rid of this auxiliary space. Otherwise, if I keep it open, then it's an object that acts on the Hilbert space tensored with an auxiliary space into the Hilbert space tensored with an auxiliary space. Okay, it's, but we introduce this auxiliary space and this auxiliary variable to eliminate it right away by tracing it and by taking a derivative and putting it equal to zero. Okay, so this is the notation. So is the notation clear? If the notation is clear, we are going to prove the claim. Ah, there is one more thing that should not be clear. What does it mean a log of an operator? A derivative of a log of an operator. So by derivative, d du of log of t of u when u equal to zero, we just mean that we do t minus one at zero times t prime at zero. That's what it means. The log derivative is t prime over t minus one. So let this be the definition of what it means to take the log to, to do this operation. If you want, this is definition. You could wonder why do I put the t minus one here, not here, or not a bit differently. We will see actually it doesn't matter, but we can take this as a definition. So, so, there are, uh, so there are several questions we can ask ourselves now. One is whether we understand the notation. The second is why is this true? And the third is why is this relevant? Right? So, of course, for now I'm asking you about the first one. Is the notation clear? Is the statement, the claim clear? Not, uh, I'm going to derive it now. We are going to check it now. I, it, the, it, it will teach us something, but is the statement clear? Is the notation clear? This is a bit esoteric. I start introducing some auxiliary space, some auxiliary variable. It takes some time to digest, so please digest it while I erase these blackboards and uh, tell me if it's clear or not. Yeah, I put there a u minus v just to have the most general case. But uh, for now, uh, you can say it's a definition. I just I have some lines with some u's and v's, and uh, it is just a definition. But uh, in practice, we are putting zero on all physical lines. But very soon, we will start putting something on zero. But for now, it's just a definition. So again, we are at the stage of discussing the notation. So tell me if the notation is unclear or not. I mean. Questions about why do we do this and so on can be postponed to the next stage. Yeah. Yeah. So here, for example, I put u minus zero, u minus zero, right? Because I put zero on the bot on the physical line. Yeah. Which also carries an index i, right? It's an Hilbert space. So let's. So if you want, I can add these arrows to indicate these are the incoming indices and the other ones are outgoing. So this object R, it has an argument. It's a, it's a, it depends on a smooth parameter. In fact, the way I wrote it, it's a, this is R of u. And it also has indices, two incoming indices to outgoing indices, because it acts on auxiliary space times physical space, giving auxiliary space times over space. So this R is an object that acts on C2 times C2, on the space of up, down, up, down, into itself. So it's a matrix with four indices. There's two indices in going, two indices outgoing.
Ah, it doesn't matter. It's, it, it's the same Hilbert space. Right. I can put it here. Yeah. This is V0, Vj, going to Vj, V0. That's right. This is the index. It's telling you which element in the Hilbert space you have. Of course, that it doesn't act diagonally on uh, on uh, on the Hilbert space. Okay. So let, let's be more. Let, let's maybe maybe write another equation that might help. R with index i one i two. J1, J2, I can write it really as a matrix, right? Saying it acts on 2 into 2 of U minus V. So this would be this picture. So I have U, V, and let's put some indices. I1, I2, J1, J2. Okay? And either we do nothing, which is uh, the term that I wrote uh, u, so it's u times doing nothing. Doing nothing means delta i1 j2 delta i2 j1. The lines just go through. Or we permute them. So delta i1 j1 delta i2 j2. So as a, uh, it takes two spins and either keeps them or swaps them. P subscript 0j means P that permutes the spins that you put in the auxiliary space and in the physical space. So if it does nothing, then the spin in the auxiliary space just goes through. So again, in pictures, I can draw this as U. I'm saying that the spin in the auxiliary space does nothing, plus i times the spin in the auxiliary space trades with the spin in the physical space. These are all good questions. I mean, this notation, it's a bit uh, weird the first time you see it, so it's good that you ask all these questions, so please continue asking if it's not yet clear. But you can write many, many equations. There's also an equilibrium between writing an infinite amount of equations or choosing them. But all these equations are redundant. I mean, all the information is captured in this first line. I'm just making it more and more and more and more explicit, but okay, at some point, okay. We start losing instead of gaining. But is it clear? So this is what our matrix is. Either the spin of the auxiliary space really does nothing, or the spin in the auxiliary space steals the spin of the physical space, and the physical space becomes the auxiliary space. Okay? So is it, is it clear? Is everything clear? Is the notation? Are you happy? Very good. So now let's prove this statement. Okay? So now we will prove the statement, and then we will see why the statement is relevant. Okay? So the proof is very simple. The first thing we notice is that uh, 1 over i times r of 0, times this r matrix at 0, is just a permutation. Okay? So if I put 0, I just get the permutation, which is just this picture here. Right? You can see in the last picture I drew there. If I put u equals 0, I get just a permutation. <clears throat> On the other hand, r prime at 0 is equal to the identity. Right? So now, using this, let's see, what is, uh, say, t of 0? We, will, we need t minus 1 of 0. So let's compute first t of 0 and then invert it. What is t of 0? Well, it's a product of these operators, or rather, let's compute, let's divide by 1 over i to the l times t of 0. Then, each time I have a 1 over i to the l times r, 
I get just a permutation. So this is just the following. I just take my physical space and I, I'm doing this. Okay. So in other words, I'm taking my position one and mapping it to position two taking my position two and mapping it to my position three and so on, up to taking my position L and mapping it to position one, right? So if I put a spin here, it goes here, a spin here, it goes here. In other words, this is just the translation operator, right? So this is momentum and this is translation by one unit to the right. Is it clear? But then, it's then, if this is true, then i to the l times the inverse now, so the inverse of this, well, it is just translating it should be e to the minus ip, just translates to the left. So if I translate everyone to the right and then everyone to the left again, I do nothing. So let's draw it. So it will now be the picture where I now translate everyone to the, to the left. Okay? So now, let's see. So what would be uh, t of zero minus one times t prime of zero, which is what we need to compute. So it will be a sum over k equal one up to L, and this k is uh, on which our matrix, uh, this derivative acts. So we have a product inside T. So when we take the derivative, it can act in each of the R matrices. It can act on the first R matrix, on the second R matrix, on the third, on the fourth, on the fifth, and so on. You agree? And now, let's see, when it does, what happens if it, well, what happens is quite simple. <clears throat> so what happens is that in the case, in position k, you have the identity instead of having the permutation. Otherwise, You agree? I just put R of zero, R of zero, R of zero, R of zero, except at one place I put R prime of zero, which is just the identity. R of zero, R of zero, R of zero, R of zero. And then I multiply this by T minus one, where T minus one is the operator that translates back to the left. You agree? So in total, what happens? I translate everyone to the right and then everyone back to the left. So I do almost nothing, except here, close to this guy, where I swap them. So this gives the sum over k of doing basically nothing, except at position k and k plus one, where the net effect is of swapping the two spins. And this is what we wanted to prove. Okay? So up to factors of i that I do not keep track of very carefully and signs that you can work them out yourself. <clears throat> okay. 
So now you ask, okay, so what? So this, cl this claim is true. Why does it help us? Remember, we should keep in mind what is our goal, is to understand why these miracles are taking place, why the model is integrable, and so on, and instead, I proved some obscure mathematical identity. Right? So now I have to connect it, I have to connect this formulation to, uh, uh, to explain why this is very closely related to understanding where are these hidden charges. And as you see, they are a bit hidden. They are so hidden that I have to suddenly make this quantum jump and go to something totally far away to explain where they are. So is it clear? Any question here? <clears throat> Which one? The, the right? So you see, look at what happened at spin number two. Spin number two goes to the right and comes back to the left. It does nothing. Spin number three does nothing. Goes to the right, goes to the left. But spin number one, two, three, four, five, spin five goes to the left, and uh, spin four goes to the right. So spin four and five were swapped. You see, there? Everyone else got untouched. So in practice, you swap two spins. And you do it at all positions, so in the end you get the stuff on the right. Yes? You mean it's k minus 1 and k? Yeah, but okay. It's a, k is a dummy index, so I have the freedom of calling k minus 1 k. But yeah, if you want to follow that, it's k minus 1 and k that are swapped. Okay. It doesn't matter, of course, the sum is the same, but... Just for the purposes of pedagogy, let me. <coughs> okay. So, um, so given, uh, Given this, uh, uh, given this statement, let's understand why this is relevant. And to understand why this is relevant, we need one more strange, one more claim, which is the following claim, that R obeys the following equation. Obeys the equation drawn in pictures like this, where I put some U, some V, and some W. So now you see putting this u, v, w that you're asking is important because I'm putting u, v, and w. So this argument is u minus v, this one is u minus w, and so on. Is equal to this same picture with same u, v, and w. It's an untrivial equation. You multiply three R matrices in two different orders, and the result is the same. Okay? So this is an equation you can check. R matrix with indices is what is there. You just take that R matrix, multiply three of them, and you check that it obeys this equation, which is called the Young-Baxter or, tri or triangle equation. So this is called the Young-Baxter equation. Now, this equation looks very similar to this equation here. But this equation, we knew what we were talking about. This were S matrix, some physical object, and so on. This R matrix is an auxiliary object that we are introducing to describe the spin chains. So I will soon make some comments about the connection between this and this. But you should not, in your mind, try to say that, to think that this and this a priori are related. You don't have the right to do it. Soon we will see that, of course, they are. But, uh, 
But a priori, this is a mathematical object out of which we construct Hamiltonians, and that is the S matrix acquired when two magnets pass by each other. There is no reason to think that there is a logical connection or physical connection between the two. It just so happens that they obey the same the equation which is drawn, which is represented by the same picture. Okay? And you ask again, okay, I trust you, I believe you. We will soon, uh, I will actually maybe even today show you how to check such kind of things in Mathematica. But then you ask again, okay, so what? So we have this Hamiltonian, it's a product of R matrices and the R matrix obeys this equation. Well, now I can finally explain why all this is relevant. Because this relation <clears throat> implies the following. Implies that if I take If I take this picture, this picture is equal because I can step by step jump one line to the left. I jump one, then jump the other, and so on, using Young Baxter several times. This picture is equal to this picture. Okay? When I can say there is a U here, a V here. <coughs> Okay, so in formulas, this picture means that I have R of U minus V, <clears throat> which acts on two auxiliary spaces, auxiliary space one, auxiliary space two, times the L matrix acting on auxiliary space one of U, times L matrix acting on auxiliary space two of V, equal to the same thing written with opposite order, L acting on auxiliary space two of V, X acting on auxiliary space one of U, times R matrix that acts on the two auxiliary spaces of U minus V. Okay, that's good. But this relation implies something very interesting. Because if I now multiply on the right by R minus 1 and trace over auxiliary 1 times auxiliary 2, so I multiply by R minus 1 such that it is appears from the right-hand side and take the trace, I obtain the equation that the trace of a product so then when I take the trace on the left hand side, R cancels because I have trace of R something R minus one and trace is cyclic. So I can put R minus one and get rid of R completely. Okay. So I get that T of U times T of V equal to T of V times T of U. In other words, that the commutator of these operators that act on the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space is equal to zero. So we got that these objects, before putting u to zero or doing anything, they are nice operators, they are families of operators that commute with each other. It is something very non-trivial to generate. If you try to generate matrices, families of matrices, families of operators that commute with each other, it's very tough. Okay? But this is very interesting, because if this is true, in particular, any functional of t commutes with any functional of v. So in particular, it implies that the Hamiltonian, which is just a particular log derivative of this t, commutes with, let me write it like this, with log of t of v. But what is this log of t of v? Well, this log of t of v, if it commutes for any v, it's an expansion that I can expand in v to the n, and the coefficients are some operator that I can call qn, where, for example, q2, we saw, or q1, is equal to the Hamiltonian. q2 is equal to some higher charge, etc. 
And so we conclude that the, there exist some he hidden charges and we just constructed them. They are just higher derivatives of this object that we construct. We proved that they commute with the Hamiltonian. So if instead of taking one derivative and putting u equal to zero, I take two derivatives and put u equal to zero, I get another operator, and that operator commutes with the Hamiltonian. And it's a simple exercise. It, it would be true without the log. The log is nice because it, make, it, it makes sure that the objects we get are local. It's the usual thing. When we take a log, we kill the disconnected components, and you can check that if you take two derivatives of these objects, that you get something that is local, like the Hamiltonian, for any number of derivatives. OK? So you conclude that these are the higher non-local charges we were after. So we proved that the Hamiltonian, the Steisenberg Hamiltonian, we proved by constructing them explicitly. It's more than a proof. It's, an, it's a constructive proof. We just constructed explicitly what are the higher charges that commute with Hamiltonian, which is exactly what we wanted. We said if we have higher charges, which in quantum mechanics means if we find some local operators, Qn, that commute with H, if we find these higher charges, then we are guaranteed to observe factorizability. So it's kind of fun that Although this picture has nothing to do with this picture, it implies this picture implies this picture here. The existence of these charges, now that I know these charges, if someone tells me I'm going to take the Heisenberg Hamiltonian and put three magnets on top of it and scatter them, I can tell you, oh, you will see something nice. I know you will see something nice. You will start scattering them and you will see they factorize. I cannot tell the person if the, the neighboring terms are zero or not. This I cannot tell. But I can tell him, if you scatter three particles, you will get three particles back. That I know for sure, because I constructed these higher, local higher charges. OK? So this doesn't tell you how to construct the states, but it tells you, it explains, it's, it demystifies what was going on. So given that this is very alien and very esoteric, we have to summarize what are the main ingredients. So what was crucial? OK, what are the main ingredients, the main ideas, or the main, the main ingredients? And there are two. One is that we construct an R matrix. There are three ingredients. The main ingredient is an R matrix with the right symmetry. What does it mean to write an object with the right symmetry? It means that when you write some, some delta functions like I wrote there, some Kronecker deltas, that you put the indices properly. That you don't start writing crazy things with the wrong indices upstairs instead of downstairs and so on. So we have a problem <coughs> with SUN symmetry. These are the invariant tensors I can write. I can only write identity or permutation. These are the only delta functions I can write. Or in other terms, more similar to the ones I was saying yesterday, if an object has SUN symmetry, I can, it can decompose it into projectors and into symmetric, and projectors into anti-symmetric, which is identity and permutation, the only two tensors I can write. So I said, I have a spin chain with XU2 symmetry. Then you can tell me immediately, OK, it, must, it is something times identity plus something times permutation. Right? So something with the right symmetry, in our case, it meant that R equal A times identity plus B times permutation. Then another thing that was crucial was that R obeys Young-Baxter. And this fixes the relative coefficients of the invariant tensors. This will fix A over B, if you impose that it obeys Young-Baxter. OK? Young-Baxter was crucial. Without Young-Baxter, we could not show that T of U commutes with T of V. We could not show that we have these extra charges. 
So Young Baxter is really a critical ingredient. It's Young Baxter that allows us to move these lines around, find relations of this sort, and show that these commute. No Young Baxter, no commutation, no charges, no nothing. Finally, the third and last ingredient is that R of zero is the permutation operator. Why is this crucial? Because without the, it's that property that makes sure that when we take a derivative and multiply by the inverse, that we get something local. It's that property that tells you that you take, if you put at zero, you just translate everyone to the left. If you take, then you invert, it's everyone to the right, or the opposite. And then you take a derivative and you are undoing almost everything. So if the, if the value at zero was something like identity plus permutation, imagine, instead of permutation, it would be a huge mess. Right? Try to imagine how would you invert, imagine instead of permutation at each node, at each node is identity plus permutation. Now good luck inverting this. It's just a huge mess. It's a big messy operator that you have no hope of ever inverting and getting some nice Hamiltonian out of it. In other words, if it was not just a permutation, you would still, this construction would go through, but the Hamiltonians you would be generated would be non-local Hamiltonians. So if you want this R of zero equal to permutation, is what ensures that we are getting local Hamiltonians and local charges. So, local, so for to have locality, it's kind of important that we have a point where the R matrix is just a permutation. So these are the main ingredients. If you think a little bit, otherwise nothing was special about SU2. The fact that it's SU2 symmetry, I can raise this a little bit if you want. These are the main ingredients. Otherwise, the fact that it is SU2 symmetry or SON or SO5 or whatever is not really crucial. So this gives us hopes of trying to understand uh, what could be um, of generating more integrable spin chains. We could just say, let's look for a spin chain which has, I don't know, SP4 symmetry, some symplectic group, some crazy stuff. What would I do? I would start with R matrix and write R matrix as a sum of linear combination of all invariant tensors of SP4. Then I fix the relative coefficient behind each of these tensors by imposing that the R matrix obeys Young Baxter. Okay? You can still be skeptical, you can still think is Young Baxter really that powerful, and we will see it is. So that will fix the relative coefficient of all the tensors. Then you make to make sure that at zero you get some permutation, otherwise the Hamiltonians will be non-local. But then otherwise you just write the same equation. Then you write an Hamiltonian, which is just the derivative of log of a product of many R matrices. And that gives you an, an, an Hamiltonian of SP4 symmetry. And then you can tell some experimentalists, try to scatter three magnets on this spin chain, you'll find something very awesome. Because we know that this Hamiltonian will have these higher charges that will tell you that the SP4 magnets will scatter in a factorized way. Okay? So this gives us a constructive approach that we are going to, to try to, to exploit. Another comment is that, you see, we took one derivative, so we got the nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. You could take two derivatives that get this higher charge, but you could also use this higher charge as an Hamiltonian, right? I mean, I can generalize this equation and say that zero is equal to the commutator of any higher charge with any other higher charge more generally. So I can take any of my charges to be the Hamiltonian. If instead of taking one derivative, I take two derivatives, I get now our nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. Now that nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, it's much less obvious that it is integrable. It will be an Hamiltonian that will involve commutator of the permutation at nn plus one and nn plus two. It will be slightly longer range Hamiltonian. That Hamiltonian we know is integrable again. And in fact, we know that because this commutes, once you find the eigenvectors of one Hamiltonian, it's also an eigenvector of the other Hamiltonian. So this longer range Hamiltonian is diagonalized by the same wave functions. We don't need to work harder. We just take the same wave functions and it diagonalizes the Hamiltonian that we get by taking two derivatives, which is slightly longer range. So that Hamiltonian has the same wave function, the same bit equations. It does not have the same dispersion relation. That will change. The dispersion relation will have to recompute it again. But it has the same bit equations written in this form. And, um, and it is diagonalized by the same wave function. Okay? <clears throat> so what we have is 
Now, you can ask, so we have, we have spin chains, right? That's a huge world. We have integrable spin chains. which is something smaller. And here we are carving a piece inside this integrable spin chains, which are chains uh, with an R matrix construction. Now, no one tells us that there cannot be other integrable theories which are not based on this construction. But here is one construction that carves out a big family of integrable mod. At least we know how to generate something within integrable mod. Okay? I think given that this is a bit subtle to digest, I think perhaps we will stop here. And next time, we will as an application of this new kind of way of thinking, of this new formalism, we will ask ourselves, okay, now let's reverse engineer. Instead of first taking the Hamiltonian and the solution and so on, let's suppose I want to study spin chains where instead of SU2 symmetry, I have SON symmetry. So at each point, I have an SON vector. And I want to ask, what is the Hamiltonian for which I know I will get such kind of miracles and I will be uh, able to diagonalize? So we will construct a family of Hamiltonians for which by construction we will, have, we will be guaranteed to have these higher charges and we will understand what are the subspace of such spin chains if I have SON symmetry instead of SU2. Okay? And as we will see later, these are precisely the sort of spin chains that are relevant for the study of ADS-CFT. Okay. Let's continue tomorrow then. <laughs>